That's it. That's that. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon. Sorry about the, uh, the delay. So, uh, I have not prepared a, uh, a detailed talk to actually um, well, present a little bit what we've, what we've done and changed the code, and also to uh, encourage you to, to tell us really what your needs for, for the library are. So, this is a project which uh, I've been doing with my colleagues Leon Petit and, and Barry Searle in Daresbury. And we work for this program called CCP9. So it's a, a UK network supporting electronic structure. And we've done these developments together with uh, Arash Mostofi, Jonathan Yates, and Giovanni Pizzi. So we've been doing this for perhaps 18 months. And at the moment, I would say that we are uh, starting the final stage. So I'm afraid it's, uh, it, it's not physics, it's just Fortran. So. So for a new library, so a library, it has to be easy for a code to use, obviously. So compared to the, the original library, the existing library, we also want to enable a, some calling DFT code or whatever kind of code wants to use the library to access the whole range of functionality that is in Fanny 90 or, or post Fanny 90. In particular, we were given the task of parallelizing the library. And that causes actually a, a lot of requirements on the underlying source which motivates most of the work. We want it to be callable from Python because to be honest, vanuarization is often the first step in somebody's Python workflow. So that's also a key thing for us. We would like it to be callable from C, but um, we haven't reached that point yet. Our library also needs to be well behaved in that it can't cause a calling program to crash. So as a standalone executable, it's completely fine for Vanya 90 to protest and, and die. But if you have, um, 50 GPU nodes and you, you suddenly are killed by a, something trivial, it, it shouldn't happen. Also, we, we need to write a, a library which uh, is not going to change. So obviously the functionality in, in Vanya 90 is going to increase, um, but it's very important that we commit to a library now, which is not going to cause software developers to need to change their code whenever new functionality is added. So that's, that's kind of important, so, okay. So, to begin with, we, we found it necessary to, to restructure the code quite severely because essentially, uh, until now, uh, all of the data in Vanya 90 has been in a, a large module. So a large module which is used actually everywhere in the code. So it is tantamount to a, to a common block. And unfortunately, the, the way that the data in this large parameters module was, uh, was assigned and allocated um, meant that you must actually uh, invoke the different subroutines of Vanya 90 in a very specific way. So before it was necessary actually to do a series of reading routines to fill up this large data structure before you could do any further calculation. So, so we've changed that by uh, essentially breaking down the data into smaller data structures which relate to some specific task and then bundling them up again, if you like, into a more manageable module structure, and then to pass all of that data explicitly as function arguments. So the way that we have reconfigured it is such that Vanya 90 actually now runs um, more or less exclusively as functions which are more or less pure. So given the same arguments, they will always return the same results. So for a library, that's tremendously useful. Actually. I think that's it, not, not dispensable. So, so we've made that happen. Uh, in addition to that, we, we now actually um, pass the MPI communicator, which essentially embodies the, the MPI framework um, throughout the code. So essentially the whole code now is, is parallel. That does not mean that the different parts of the code can use parallelism effectively. And we haven't changed the parallelization strategy, but it is now such that actually all of the different subroutines could be made parallel if, if one wanted to, to do it. The other thing, and, and so, so those things are, are fine. What is a little bit more invasive actually is the requirement to make uh, the error handling in the code a little bit more robust. And unfortunately, error handling in, in Fortran is, is really primitive. So in order to give um, the kind of behavior that we want, so specifically we want uh, a routine which somehow causes an error state, um, not to cause the program to crash, but to immediately return operation to the, to the calling subroutine with some indication of what the error was, such that 
Um, when value 90 ultimately returns to the calling program, the calling program can then decide what it wants to do. And in particular, there are obviously some conditions which are not errors, but which are also not perfect execution. So for example, if uh, a vanuarization process has not converged, it is not an error state, but it is a condition that the calling program needs to know about. So in that case, for example, we've, we've configured it such that an error code is given to the program or returned to the program, and the program can then decide whether or not, for example, it wants to redo the vanuarization. So unfortunately, doing that in Fortran is a bit of a pain, and it means that, uh, well, well, I'll talk about it. Yeah. So with those changes in place, we have essentially then um, caused the main executables, so both Vanier 90 and post Vanier 90, to be essentially wrappers around the library. Um, what the library means really are the set of subroutines with their now rather long argument lists, but which, and this is what we're, we're currently working on, can also be shortened with basically shorthands and other wrappers. So the meaning of the executables now is, is nothing special. They are they could be any DFT code, which is calling then the, the machinery underneath. So yeah, number seven is where we are now. So actually designing what bits of data we can expect and require a user to pass the different subroutines and what we need to kind of fill in for them. So, so yeah, the first thing are, are the data types. So uh, in the past, uh, large amounts of data of various kinds were stored in this parameters module, which we've broken up into lots of different types. The types we have, or we have decided to do that such that there is actually a plethora of types. There are many types, which each contain relatively few data members with some specific application. What we've also done is move the, uh, the initialization of these data members from the parameters reading routines into the type definition. And the advantage of that is that in the library interface, we can create an instance of these variables and they are already initialized. So in the future, when you, when you come to add new variables, um, unfortunately, this means a little more work. You need to find the appropriate place where that variable belongs. But I think that that's, not, that's not terrible, but also to give it a meaningful default. So obviously for those cases where a meaningful default is not possible, we require the user to specify it somehow. So this is the first change. There are lots of types. So, so here I've, I've grepped simply for the different types that we've defined um, specific to the Vanya executable. So, so Vanya 90 just does the vanuarization, the disentanglement and some rather trivial kind of plotting. Um, there are also some types which are shared between Vanya 90 and post Vanya 90. And there are a whole set of essentially properties variables which are only used in post Vanya 90. And we have essentially uh, separated Vanya 90 and post Vanya 90 entirely. So any code which is specific to one or the other are in the specific cases. So everything that relates to Vanya 90 is now definitely in a file with Vanya 90 appended to it. Those things which are common to both don't, and those things which are specific to post Vanya 90 are in the post Vanya 90 directory. So, but there are, there are many types now. Using them then, so, so passing these types down the, down the, the call tree, if you like, um, requires a little bit of work. Um, in particular, you need to, so here the, the, there wasn't enough space, you, you need, of course, to include the modules which define the types themselves. Then you declare the instances of the specific types you need. And essentially going down from the, the top level call of Vanya 90 or post Vanya 90, you start off with many instances of these derived types. And as you get to the bottom with the there are more specific things like uh, get the gradients and so on. The arguments become simply their, their trivial uh, values. So here in, in this routine, we pass various different types. And in some cases we don't, and we simply pass one variable from them. So we've tried to do that in a, in a reasonable way, but unfortunately it does mean that all of the, all of the functions have arguments and there's no way back. <laughs> so, um, in other cases, so a lot of the code is, is kind of simpler. Um, here, for example, we, we got rid entirely of the checking of whether or not you're on the route to do printing. So if you want to print or write to standard out, firstly, don't assume that standard out is what you want it to be because actually we give standard out en masse back to the calling program. Or more specifically, we ask the calling program to give us a unit number, which we write to. So you cannot simply write to star because 
that may mean your your output goes who knows where, actually. But in in reality now also whatever you write, uh, check that the, the, the velocity level is greater than zero because that is also the flag for whether or not you're on the route. So, so the error handling is, is, is really tricky. So in particular, the, the error handling in MPI, which I'll talk about, it, it is simply the case that Fortran doesn't offer a nice way to do it. And this means that you have to change the way you write code. It's a little unfortunate. To do the error handling or to emulate error handling, um, we have defined an error type. And the error type scores a string, so an error message and a number. So in the case of an, of an error, so, so here we check whether or not an allocation succeeds. If it doesn't, then the, the error variable is set to something greater than zero. And we call the error handler, if you like. All this does in reality is allocate a variable called error and gives it a message. But the error also is an MPI operation. So all the processes, all the different ranks need to be aware that an error has happened on any of them. So that imposes also some, some restrictions. In any event, you discover an error, you set the error flag, and then you return. So unfortunately, you, you have to return because you can't, you can't throw or catch. So you have to give up. In addition to that, you need then to check any function that could set an error to see whether or not it has set an error. And if it has, then you must again return. So here, for example, you call van phases. You presumably do some allocation, which may fail. Um, it may or may not have set the error condition in the error variable. And if it has, you have to also return. So as a programmer, you need to now add these steps for every function that could take an error or could generate an error. That's a little laborious. The particular way that we codify the error in addition to the string and the number, um, so, so the string is given obviously here in the argument, the number is given by which function you use. So we provided five or six different error allocation routines which give a different number. So in reality, the numbers are, are unimportant. You get a negative number if it's something that could be fixed by, for example, iterating further or a positive number for some particular errors. The kinds of errors that you have, for example, here is alloc, but there is also input if the user is given some bad value or whatever, it doesn't matter. In any event, um, this routine also allocates the error variable. So the error variable, it does not contain data, it, but it is allocatable. And the purpose of that is, is rather nice. So there is a, if you like a trick, um, that upon the entry to a subroutine in Fortran, any allocatable data object, which is marked intent out, will be deallocated. So we can, if you like, um, hotwire that behavior to, to cause <laughs> uh, a real error handler to be called. So, so in this case, if you enter a subroutine with an error which has already been set, then the deallocation of the error variable will cause a catastrophic failure. So, but the only way that that could happen is if a developer has failed to check the error value upon the return from a program. So, so this provides actually a, a, a tool to make sure that a developer hasn't missed the opportunity to set an error. And as such, so, because this would crash the code, because it calls, in this case, you see untrapped error is called if this allocated variable is ever deallocated. And you don't want that in, in production code, so you can comment it out. So we think this is of use particularly for development. So when things are working, it should never happen, but, but it's there. The other, the big headache really also with, with the error handling is that um, all the processes need to know when an error happens, but how do they be made aware of it? So um, the reason that's a problem is that in MPI, uh, you can of course send a signal that you have discovered an error, but the other processes need to listen for it, which means effectively that you need to poll periodically for an error condition. And, and that's actually what we do. And the way we do that is by having a, a collective reduce. So we reduce the error variable on all nodes. 
and we do that before every MPI operation. And the way that that works is that you can arrive at this reduction clause from two ways. Either everything is okay on that rank and you get there before an MPI operation, or you get there because something's gone wrong and you've arrived at the error handler. So, so that works very nicely. The only problem is that, well, there are two problems. The first is that you have an additional uh, collective MPI operation for every MPI operation you have, firstly, but it's also just one integer, so it's not, it's not likely to be pathological. The second more serious thing is that this strategy of reducing the error variable only works if you only do collective operations otherwise. Because if you also or additionally do point to point communications, then you cannot guarantee that other ranks are in a position to collect the collective reduction on the error variable. So in practice, that means that you cannot currently with this system do point to point communication or you can do it, but it may, <laughs> it may fail in terms of the error handling. So if the point to point generates an error, you cannot guarantee that the other ranks will be in a position to detect the error. But in practice, we noticed that there was exactly one use of point to point in the code. So we've, we've reformulated it so they're now none. So, but if somebody can think of a way to do point to point with, with error handling, we would, we would love to know because it's a puzzle actually. So again, we think, so we don't know what the, in real terms, what the, what the reduction of, a, of an integer on a, in a practical job means. Is that a serious overhead? So you can deactivate it if, if it is, we don't know. So, so having done those things, um, we reach making the library interface. So what constitutes a library interface essentially are the subroutines, which obviously you have written and we have given argument lists to. Um, or alternatively, you can invoke essentially the whole of, of Vanya 90. And that's essentially what the old library did. So the old library would also parse the input file, for example, and set up really the, the same data in the same way. Um, obviously, we, we want something, something different. We want uh, a list or a set of interfaces which are as easy to use as possible, but which are also not complicated. So what we have elected to do is to keep those arrays which are physically meaningful and essentially fundamental to vanillarization exactly as they are, and we would expect the user to pass them. By user, I mean a, a, a DFT code developer. And in addition, um, we have prepared if you like, agglomerations of these defined types with their defaults. And in the DFT code, you would create an instance or, or however many you like of this uh, complicated type. Using that type, you would modify it, setting variables or options that you want. And then you would pass that also then to the routines which do the actual numerical work. So, so that's our plan. So at the moment, this is how the library interface looks. So you can have a look. I think our branch is not public, but we can, we can make it public this week. And we have so really simple, simple functions. So at the moment, we, we simply also can read the input. So if you want to, you can, you can replicate the old behavior. You define an object of this uh, complicated type called whatever this instance is called helper. There are also some options for plotting and transport, which Vanya 90 also takes. And then simple stuff like the M matrix, et cetera. So this then essentially becomes our, our library interface. What is missing from it is a nice way to set values. And it's a little bit tricky because firstly, in the passing methodology that exists in Vanya 90, there is actually a lot of um, detailed and important checks on the sanity of inputs. And it is also the case that different inputs affect the uh, allocation of variables which are required at different times. So it is not possible to provide simple setting functions for all of the large number of data members that we need. So instead, what we have in mind is, again, to go through the, the reading parser, but no longer acting on an input file, but acting on a, on a data stream, which we set up. And we would do that so where you, you specify exactly the, the command string that you would put in an input file 
as a string to set an option, and then also here some, some value. The value would not be stored as a string, it would actually be data. So there would be sets of different functions to accommodate different kinds of data and arrays. Um, those would then be interpreted by essentially the parsing routines which exist now. So, so that's what I actually would like to do this, this week. Um, it would be extremely helpful if you can tell us what you would like or require as a, uh, a program which might call the Vanya 90 library. So, because essentially at the moment we are, we are really defining what these interfaces are. So, one, so yeah. One thing that, that we have noticed, so, so my colleague Barry has uh, been using the, the Python wrapping software developed by James Kermode called F90 wrap. And F90 wrap um, essentially calls F to pi. Uh, it generates a, actually a huge set of, of C interfaces and then it interprets and builds a Python interface to the objects which we've defined. And that works essentially out of the box. So, so this example, there are a couple of examples in, in the source, which, which do exactly what you expect. You set up some, some numerical arrays. In this case, we, where are we? Does, does, uh, we ba, 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 set up the list of K points here explicitly. We read the input from a input file. So this is one of the, one part of the library interface is a routine which will read the input file. Um, so in this case, it reads options from the input file, the set of K-mesh, K-points that, that are, are needed for this example, um, da, 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 and ultimately then reads the, the overlap matrices and calculates the uh, maximally localized Vanier functions. So this all already works and is, is quite nice. So, so that's nice. So, in this instance, it is the case that um, the Python, well, Python, of course, has a nice object orientation and understands our module structure very, very transparently. So, unfortunately, that's that's not the case for for C. So, so what do users need to know? So, so nothing, because actually all of those changes don't affect the behavior of the code at all. Um, one thing which which is the case is that now. Um, there is really no separate software between the main executable and the library. And in the past, it was the case that users would compile a parallel executable for Vanya 90 and post Vanya 90, and in the same directory, partially recompile the source to give a serial library. So that no longer works. So in some sense, the compilation environment is different because either you compile the MPI version or not. So, so that's important. That actually, that caused a, an issue for somebody who wanted to do it. So, what developers need to know, you need to know actually what all the different types are because we've um, taken all of your data and packaged it up differently. So unfortunately, when you change things, you need to go and find what was there. But we think, and I think we, and Arash and Jonathan kindly went through this kind of laboriously, it should not be insane. So, but, but um, is also a big change. The definition of the read routines has also changed. So if you add new options, for example, that would be affected here. So um, the read routines will change again when uh, I change the behavior to also allow reading from a stream. So, so those parts of the code are, are subject to change. Another thing that's changed is that um, because we separated the read routines from Vanya 90 and post Vanya 90, um, it is no longer the case that each of the codes recognizes the keywords from the other code. So one has to clear them out explicitly. So in the case that, for example, you add a new keyword to post Vanya 90, you have to also put it in this function, which will get rid of it in Vanya 90. Otherwise it breaks the compatibility of the input files. So that's a, a detail, but it needs to be known. Yeah. It's really useful to give defaults to new variables because, um, in the, in the library use where uh, a DF code has caused a, a, an instance of our large variable, our blob of data, um, we will then go through if like a reduced form of input parsing, but it is not the same um, param routines that 
have been called before, which would do a lot of assignment and initialization. So if there is a, a data variable which can be initialized to a sensible value, then it should be. And it also should be in the type definition. So if that, if that makes sense. Um, the setting error. So there, there are a few in error.f90. You can, you can choose one of five or six that we defined or add to them if they're uncomfortable. Essentially, they all do the same thing by allocating the error variable and actually doing an MPI call if it's an MPI build. They otherwise assign a number. So they're really the same. The bigger thing is to check the status of, of the error variable after all the function calls. That's a little bit laborious, but there's no other way. So if there is another way that we would be really glad to get rid of the thousand times return that we had to insert in, in the code. So again, also the, the standard out. Um, similarly, standard error, I don't think we touch anywhere. So, so standard error at the moment is only touched by the Vanya 90 executable. So nothing in the, the library code, nothing below the, the main routines actually should be touching standard error at all. No. And yes, and this restriction on, on collective MPI operations. We honestly cannot find a nice way to make point-to-point -point work. It may not really be possible. I'm not sure. So in some sense, um, the propagation of error is an intrinsically collective problem. So, so yeah, so where are we? So the Python interface, uh, my colleague Barry is working on at the moment. Uh, my other colleague Leon is working on actually a, a use of the library in, in the plane wave Tavania code. So this week I would like to write actually the setter routines. And that's a little bit important because um, the setter routines are the way in which you would provide options to this big blob of, of data. So in addition to obviously the, the, simple, the simple matrices that you, you have. And, um, later when we, when we have, if you like, a, a, a polished uh, library definition. Um, we'd like to see actually how we can improve the, the use of MPI. So at the moment, um, the, the parallel decomposition is, is rather simple. Um, and one of the key things that, that we were assigned to do was actually investigate cases where the MPI decomposition used by the DFT code is of very different nature to what would be optimal for Vanya 90. So an extension of the library interface might be actually a way to uh, reconfigure actually, or perhaps make a, a, a partition of the MPI communicator to do more efficient MPI work. So we've made a lot of changes to, to your code, but we think they're not bad. So they are improvements. So on one hand, passing arguments actually comes with a small performance overhead, which you notice and you can measure. Um, but otherwise, what we haven't done, but what becomes possible is that in many places in the code, um, because it is not always clear what the condition of the large param module was, there are calls to functions just in case. So particularly in the, in the post value 90, there are many times where the real space Hamiltonian is, or the function to calculate the real space Hamiltonian is, re, is re-invoked, even though it is not necessary just in case it might be. So now that the real space Hamiltonian, for example, is passed explicitly to all of the functions that would need it, it's not necessary to have this kind of strategy of, of um, just in case <laughs> calling. So, so some changes can happen, I think, because now you no longer need to rely on the condition of the underlying common address space. You have simply the arguments that the function has, and they are guaranteed. So, so I think that in the future will lead actually to some uh, simplification, even if at the moment actually that obviously the argument lists are a little bit cumbersome. No. So I think yeah, we have we have some time. So really, we we're really interested to know what you think or what you would like in the interface definition. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing your work. I think this is really of paramount importance and relevance for all of us, users and developers alike. Of course, we have time for questions. Uh, okay.
uh, well, thanks a lot. I mean, I think this is super important. Um, so I have three small questions. Mm -hmm. um, so could you make your branch, you know, could you create a public branch as soon as possible on the, you know, one year GitHub yeah. and also make it very clear when you intend to merge it with the develop so That's that we have enough time, you know, to, to test because I expect this will take us some time to adjust mm -hmm. and also to give you feedback. So, so the, the, the the state of affairs is that the the use of types, the argument lists, the error handling are now in the main develop branch. Already. Um, yeah. So, if you like, those constitute the painful parts. <laughs> so those are those are actually now um, the the main um, branch. What is different now are the additions of the library interfaces, which are all on top of that actually. So, right. Um, so, so certainly, yes, we should, will indeed yeah. make it make it public because it would be nice also to have um, have other people join in and, and yeah, yeah, and then we can make some yeah. testing. And if yeah. we have an issue, because I think it's difficult, like for me, to tell you exactly, you know, yes, what the potential problems would be if I don't, you know, try exactly. It, say. Um, um, the situation is that uh, now that all of the the um, the refactoring, if you like, is done. Um, the library interface itself is in one file, so there is a file with with these these subroutines, yeah, which is actually all rather straightforward. So, all they do are is call other subroutines. It, it, it's sure, it's, yeah. it's rather straightforward. So, we would be very happy to have other people working on it with us. Yeah, that'd be yeah. Great. So let, let yeah. us know when you make it public, and then yeah, and then yeah. So that's my first. Then, um, sure. So yeah. we've been working. So the work's been in a private repository because, I mean, it was messy and yeah, there was quite a lot was. of dirty laundry that needed to be done. And we sort of just felt that was best done behind. But no, I know. But I think now, Jeremy, I mean, correct me, now we could actually For move sure. everything to, yeah. a, to a branch on the main repo. because it's Essentially, everything we're doing now is on top of the existing functionality. So it doesn't. It, nothing we do now breaks backwards compatibility in any way or changes anything anyone would do. So that's okay. Uh, the existing changes certainly certainly did, um, but not not anymore. No. So if you like, we're we're really over the over the hill of. Yeah, but so if you make, for example, this file available, then we can yeah. go through and yeah. And so the the second, do you plan to implement or increase support uh, of the test suite specifically for this library? Yeah. So. And by that, I mean not testing one year 90 calling one year yes. 90 in library mode, but really maybe writing a small program we, that yeah. would pass fake parameter to exactly. that library <laughs> and then have you know a set of reference data. And then that would be easier for other code because I think um, external code can have different stages yes. that, for example, one year 90 itself would never experience. And so if we find some of it, we, we can easily ourselves add a new test with those specific parameter exactly. so, um, so make it that sort of framework to allow us to easily add yep. a new test with those weird parameters let's say that might be relevant to us yes um, so so indeed so we have um, two ideas along these lines so firstly so Leon is going to to make a pull request in quantum espresso for the stuff he's doing in, in PW Spanier. so essentially he's replacing their call to the old library with a new one um, and we will also make a, a minimal driver in the test framework. So there is a minimal driver for the old one, and essentially there will be something similar for the new one, but shorter because it's a simpler interface, actually. And you'll add one yeah. or two tests to the test suite. Exactly. So that, okay, that's yes. fantastic. And finally, but that's, uh, I guess, a detail. Do, do you plan to support some form of automatic documentation like Ford? And because I saw that you had double exclamation mark. Well, so, so yeah, we, <laughs> we took what comments we found and kept them and right right yeah we haven't added a lot of documentation oh, yes. so okay. we're, thanks we're a little old-fashioned but yeah <laughs> hi thank you for all this work and i have a question about this functional paradigm yes so currently i have little experience of this new interface but Say I want to develop a new functionality inside of some inner function, mm -hmm. and I need some input variable that was not there already, for mm -hmm. example, guiding centers. Yes. 
Then previously, what I had to do is just write use parameters only guiding centers. But now I have to add the guiding center type in the input arguments. And I have to do that recursively for all the functions in the call stack or to pass that argument to the innermost function. Yeah. So, so that becomes quite complicated when developing new functionalities. So it, it can it, I, do. Yeah. So indeed. So it is also the case that in different parts of the code, um, variables are needed or are used, if you like, at the bottom of the of the call structure. Um, in a way which is absolutely unnecessary, but which requires then that they are present in argument lists everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, that is slightly true. Um, when adding new variables, so we found um, that in reality, it's very unusual to, um, to have a new variable in isolation. And the new variable that you want to add probably will already be grouped with other variables which exists for the for the kind of task that you are doing. So in that case, so let's see if I had an example. Um, so for example, if you, you added something to the, the site symmetry type, it's already being passed as such. So it anywhere that the, the site symmetry stuff is being used, it's already present. So it isn't as bad as it could be, but in principle, yeah. In, in practice, normally you put it in or one of the predefined types and it's fine. And it will be present where you need it because the other things you need are already there. So, but yeah, that's true. Yeah. So my question is, it, would it be possible to expose some, like some constant, not constant, but some input parameters that will never change when one set up as a global constant instead of passing to the, to, as a arguments? Um, so um, we don't really want, you mean, so by a global constant, you mean, uh, so an unchanging parameter? For example, like the k-mesh information, like the size of the k-point grid, that will never change in a 190 run. But it changes from calculation to calculation, so. OK. <laughs> I'll, I'll discuss later. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can try to answer the yeah. comment, which is mm -hmm. the, the reason to try to avoid to have global variables, which in a sense is what used to be before and what you're suggesting, is that if you just run one Vanier 90 run, that's not a problem. But you can imagine a DFT code who wants to run 20 vanarizations at the same time in 20 different communicators. So if you have a global variable, maybe the K-mesh could be different in every calculation. That's why Jerome and colleagues yeah. had to, to really split it. And as you're right that it's going to be more cumbersome. Uh, hopefully, already the fact they are grouped in types, you might already have it. And the fact we, we spend some time to, together, Ralph, Jonathan, uh, Jerome, etc., to try to collect them by, by let's say, logic, <laughs> logically, yeah. uh, you should already probably find it. But if you don't, indeed, uh, you, will not, you need to add it. Actually, this is a good point, to, maybe to, to think about what we declare as public interface. In the sense, yes. probably we don't, since this may happen, Probably as a library, we don't want people to, even if there are Fortran code, to use directly the internal routines. We want to use those few yeah. functions that Jerome showed before. In this sense, actually, the other comment I wanted to give is, it would be good if today or tomorrow already we kind of collect together, definitely uh, Roxanne and Samuel, but anybody here who's using or wants to use the library to start collecting use cases and have a little working group on this. Thank you very much. Yeah, so just to add to that, I mean, it's it's a it's a balance between having uh, a very well defined state for the calculation, mm -hmm. so that you can run, as Giovanni said, multiple instances that have clearly defined states, and you don't have these sort of variables that are floating that you just kind of never know what they're set to, and uh, this sort of extra overhead in development, which is as you say, if if it turns out at some point in the future you do need to add a new variable that somehow has to be added to every every subroutine call in the entire stack. And potentially that means every code that interfaces to Vanier 90 might have to tweak its interface to include this additional variable in the worst case scenario, right? In the in, in a worst case pathological scenario 
where that variable we, we makes its way all that. the way up yeah. to the top. Yeah. Um, so, mm. so there's there's sort of this balance between those two things, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. So that's why I was saying that probably one should just use. Hopefully, we shouldn't have missing things in this, but we should really design this in few ten. I don't know. Maybe we can add a few more interfaces very well so we have everything there and those should never change because those are the one uh, code should use that's the plan yeah i mean we can always add more the point those should not change hopefully yeah. exactly what there are always way to, to do it i mean we can have a new version v2 or whatever and have more parameters but it's gonna be a uh, very painful to maintain so i think this design discussion will be very very relevant So you mentioned uh, F90 wrap. I'm not all that familiar with that. Um, how does it deal with user-defined types and mapping from like Fortran compound types into Python like native data types? Can you repeat the last bit? How does F90 wrap map the Fortran compound data types into the native Python data types? In terms of dictionaries or arrays. Gosh, so how it internally does it, I, I do not know. No, that it is capable of doing it is, is okay. clear, but I don't know how. No. In the Python code that you showed, yeah. I don't know if you could navigate sure. to that yeah. chart. I guess I, I can't see it all that well, but it appears that you're calling the input reader routine in Python. In this case, yeah. And what what is like the return value look like, or what what does it how does it populate? So, so in this case, for example, it, it affects data. So, so the state of data is changed by this call. So data is, is, is an instance of our, what in the, the latest slides is called helper. <laughs> um, but this composite data structure with, with lots of data structures in it. So um, where are we? Just, just, um, uh, global type. So lib global type is essentially this, uh, a large container for all of the different data types that we have okay so but there is a, a um so the class structure here is the same as our our module structure so okay well hopefully i'll talk but to how, you about how that is okay. actually manifest in python i don't i don't know so i'm not a, a python programmer so <laughs> maybe i can try to comment for what i understand i think i don't know if 90 wrap but this wraps f to pi from numpy I think it uh, natively maps basic types, so not Python or Python dictionaries, just uh, arrays, numpy arrays yeah. and uh, strings and integers. And what you can do, which probably I guess, from the, I don't know, I guess this is what's happening there. You can call through Fortran to initialize the types and get back a pointer to it in Python that you can yeah. use. I'm not sure there is an easy way to map from dictionaries directly into the types. You can, but in the end, the, the way around it is probably what uh, Jean was saying to have set the routines where you pass a string let's say and there is some parsing which takes care of setting the correct uh, pi, uh, fortran types so essentially you pass only strings and floats and integers yeah, from yeah it, it might be possible you're right yeah but but this is not a it's not a dictionary it's a, an object. Yeah. Yes. So first of all, amazing work. Have you thought about incorporating non-blocking MPI calls to facilitate the error handling? So yes, we thought about this. So of course you can write in a in a in a window. Um, the problem with that is that you, you still need, to, so firstly, there are, there are two problems. So the first is that you need to poll it occasionally on all of the other nodes. And the second problem is that um, you have a, a problem with the ordering. It can perfectly happen that the, so if you consider that one rank is going to fail and the other ranks are fine, it can happen that the other ranks all check the status of the window before the rank which is going to fail has had the ability to write that it's in the error state. So in that sense, then all the other nodes believe that everything is fine when actually then they are not. So, so the problem there is you, you need to synchronize, which is exactly what you can't do with not blocking MPI. Um, 
so so therefore it, it doesn't help unfortunately <laughs> yes okay so there is one one question here and then another one there I guess more of a comment. I mean, it seems like the way you've done the error handling is very well thought out. And it looked like you referenced the error FX. I guess that this is another library or approach to doing error handling. Have you thought about, maybe it's general enough, but separating out the functionality and actually having this be a Fortran library for doing error handling? So Giovanni, yes. <laughs> no. Thanks. Now, I think in the sense error FX is doing that. The point is that because Fortran as a language doesn't have certain features, you cannot really make a library. You can make a library of little wrapper or helper scripts, but in the end it's more like a description of a coding pattern. As yeah. Jerome explained, you have to re return after setting an error. It's not something you can write in a library and have a, like a throw in another language or a raise in Python. So unfortunately, you cannot really get to the point of writing a proper library. What ErrorFX does is since uh, Balint also developed a custom preprocessor for Python, some of these things are written in a much easier, in a one line uh, raise operation, let's say, because the, the preprocessor would then convert it into a few more lines, including the return statement, for instance. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to use such a preprocessor, ErrorFX would also help you. I, now I don't know in 190 if you're changing a lot, I mean, we're not using the preprocessor. I don't know if the way errors are dealt with are different or really the same as ErrorFX is, I don't know, but just to explain why it's not a library if you want, or it's not so easy to do it. Oh, the spirit is the same. So the difference is, is that we, we also stick in the, this MPI rejection in the middle. So, but yeah, it, it's essentially the same. Uh, just a technical yeah. comment, but I guess we can discuss uh, mm -hmm. later, just mention. Um, I think the most important discussion is what we said before, to have users of the so developers who want to use the library mm -hmm. to discuss. One thing, maybe if you have time, we can chat is, we have, as you mentioned, we have a number of places in the code where we have to know what are the inputs and maybe you have two or three files in which you have to reference them because of the various mm -hmm. executables. One thing we might try, might try to do to simplify our life is maybe to have a but a, a Python function which generates the Fortran code. So we have a center, I don't know if it's possible, we should probably try to, to see if it's possible, but we have a central reference in YAML of all the Python variables mm -hmm. with some metadata type as the default. And we generate these two or three Python, these two or three Fortran files automatically. Maybe it's not possible, but if it's possible, we avoid problems. And since we have uh, GitHub actions, yes. if a person forgets to do it at commit time, uh, you would get an error. So just as a thought maybe it's reasonable yeah. I, I think we'll have yeah. if we forget anyone well we, we have time also during the week hi so so you asked like you know if there's a suggestion for something that would be useful for a user so for example this last function banyarize right so inside that function the code like iteratively finds a gauge that is maximum localized. Mm -hmm. I think it would be nice if there is a, like a Python interface where I could go inside of that loop and maybe modify things while they are being diagonalized. So for example, uh -huh. let's I say I have eight bands, <laughs> let, let's say I have eight bands and I want to run this first four separate from the next four. Uh -huh. And then, you know, every time the code wants to mix first four, but the next four, I just set that to zero or, you know, something like that where I could yeah. like, while it's diagonalizing, I'm kind of modifying it so it kind of finds a different gauge than the one that it would find itself. Is that possible or is that like a different? It, it, so, so of course it's absolutely possible in that um, the, the process of annualization happens in a couple of, of subroutines. Unfortunately, there's kind of a slightly megalithic <laughs> main routine. Um, you would need to do some change to extract the individual iteration parts into a, a smaller function. But then, of course, you could interface to that and manipulate things between calls. Yeah. So it's not currently possible because um, the program flows uninterruptedly. <laughs> but, but you could do it without massive hassle. Yeah, of course. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. If there are no other questions, I think we can thank Jerome thank a lot. You. 
Thank you. Okay, so this was the last uh, talk for today. Now we have a, <clears throat> a small coffee break upstairs. And after then, it's supposed to be, you know, group discussions and, you know, uh, later on, <clears throat> probably during the week, this will turn more into coding. Uh, so I think we can, you know, just form groups. Uh, I think some of the discussion will started. And if not, we just meet uh, at um, 7 p.m. right here at the Tavernet Almoro. And of course, all the participants are invited to, to join.